Hello, everybody. Let me get this out of the way real quick. Risk of Rain 2 content is not stopping. Don't worry, I am absolutely still playing the game. All right, now that's out of the way. Welcome to part one of my beginner's guide for Path of Exile. In this video, I will cover the fundamental aspects of the game outside of its gameplay. Covering game mechanics, such as the passive tree, offense and defense stats, etc. will be in part two. If you haven't heard of PoE, this video is for you. If you've heard about it, but you haven't given it a shot, this video is for you. If you've downloaded it, but never really got into it due to intimidation or any other reason, this video is for you. And finally, if you are a newer player to the game and are struggling to understand some things, this video is for you. There are some timestamps in the description for those of you that are looking only for a specific topic. Again, gameplay related mechanics will be in part two. Before I get into the details, here are some bullet points on things you may be wondering. Number one, the game is 100% free to play. There are no pay to win aspects and absolutely none of the content is locked behind a paywall. However, there is a single purchase that I and many other players would highly, highly recommend. Even then, I really only recommend it if you get into the end game stage. I'll cover this purchase later, but know that it is very cheap and worth every cent. Again, no purchases are required for you to play the game like everyone else. Number two, the game is pretty well optimized and is performed performance is improving with every major patch. Yes, there are outliers, but for the most part, any PC can run this game just fine. You will probably have to tweak your settings and sacrifice quality for performance if you're on a lower end PC, but at the end of the day, you will still be able to play the game without major issues such as crashes. Number three, there is a ton of content, like an absurd amount. Personally, I believe the amount of progression and more importantly, replayability Path of Exile offers is bar none. As in making new characters, leveling them up, and trying out new skills and builds is not only fun, but even feels necessary with you looking forward to starting a fresh character and trying new things out. Number four, there is always something new to learn. Speaking of the content and replayability, a huge factor in why there is so much content is because behind every item, skill, class, etc. are elaborate game mechanics and systems. Learning the interactions everything has with one another is why many people regard PoE as a theory crafter's dream. In fact, I'd wager that most of you who have heard of PoE probably know it by the mention of its passive skill tree, something which looks like this. Oh, cool. I just leveled up. All right, let's put this passive point in. Whoa. Uh, okay, I mean, that's not that bad. I mean, we got projectile damage, life, okay. And it looks like more life. Okay, so that's, that must be life. This must be damage. So let's let's just damage, okay, damage, dam bows, like what? what physical damage, what? 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 Now, don't be intimidated. Once you play for more than a few hours, things that seem daunting at first, such as the passive tree, will start to make sense after a little experimentation. Which brings me to my last point. Number five, the game is equal part challenging as it is fun, at least to a new player. I like to think of learning PoE as the same as learning Dark Souls. Overcoming the many trials and tribulations that PoE offers is a huge draw to its fun factor. PoE is the Dark Souls of ARPGs, by the way. <laughs> as in, if you are expecting the game to hold your hand and give you a cookie cutter build to follow and drop class specific loot for you to hover over and say, yep, that number is higher, let's put it on, you'll be disappointed. However, if you look to figure out why things work the way they do and get excited when any new element is introduced that challenges you to learn something new, this is absolutely the game for you. To summarize the points I've covered, Path of Exile is packed to the brim with content. To a newer player, it will take a lot of time to figure the game out, and there is a crazy amount of replayability within PoE. If you enjoy a challenge and are looking for a game that doesn't hold your hand along the way, PoE has you covered. It is also 100% free to play, so why not give it a shot anyway? I promise it's not that hard to get started. I should also mention that Grinding Gear Games, or GGG, who are the the developers of PoE are very open-minded with the community. They frequently visit the Path of Exile subreddit and more often than not communicate to the community what decisions they are making for the game and most importantly why. They are a shining example of game developers in 2019 and to my standards I have yet to see a developer this involved and respectful to their players. So if that's important to you as well, there you go. Also, there is a ton of loot, like a ton of loot. If anything I've said this far interests you, go ahead and start your download on Steam or the official website. And while you wait, let's get into some of the helpful details that will speed up your understanding of PoE. Path of Exile is, well, kind of intimidating to say the least, to newer players. At its core, the concepts are simple. Choose a class and kill things to acquire better gear and level up so your character kills things even faster and you acquire even more gear and levels to kill so you get the idea. However, despite its core concepts being simple, the plethora of game mechanics combined with the vast array of choices on how to progress your character turn Path of Exile off to a lot of people. Again, I plan to cover core game mechanics in depth in part two of my beginner's guide. Here, I will go over the absolute bare bones basics that will help speed up your own learning of those topics. To many people, myself included, Path of Exile's main draw is the sheer number of choices you have in making a character. These choices come through PoE's extremely detailed systems. In other words, if you love learning things and figuring the game out on your own, theory crafting as most call it, then Path of Exile is absolutely your game. If you enjoy the freedom of being able to choose and do practically whatever you want, but need some guidance along the way, be on the lookout for part two 
of this guide. All right, let's get into the basics. The most important point I can make is that every word in this game means something, as in if you pay attention to exactly, and I mean exactly, how an item or mechanic is worded, you will figure out exactly what it does. Now, that's easier said than done in some cases, but in those cases, I recommend using the wiki. I know, I know, you should be able to learn a game 100% through the in-game systems and not rely on external sources of information and all that stuff, I know. But this ain't no baby game. Your skills and gear are not spoon-fed to you based on your class choice, so again, the number of options of what to do can be overwhelming at times. Reading up on the wiki can and more than likely will speed up your learning of these in-depth systems. Here's an example of what I mean by pay attention to the exact wording. One of my characters from a past league, don't worry, we'll cover what leagues are in a second, used a sword called On's Might. The focal point here are the mods to do with frenzy charges. For now, all you need to know is that every character in PoE has a maximum of three frenzy charges without investing anything special. You'll notice I get some accuracy rating when I have my maximum number of frenzy charges and some crit multiplier when I have none of my frenzy charges. I won't go over exactly what all this means, but it basically equates to I get more damage when I have all frenzy charges and when I have none of my frenzy charges. What makes this sort of interesting though is the mod minus one to maximum frenzy charges. Here is where the exact wording comes into play. This takes the base amount of three charges down to two, but wait, this is a one handed sword. <gasps> I have two hands. Bam, here's another one of the swords. This means I essentially get double the effect of the item due to, you know, having two swords. Unique items and their modifiers in PoE do not function like in games such as League of Legends, where you can only have one of the unique effects active per item of the same name. Also, if you call these items legendaries, please kindly uninstall your game. Okay, thank you very much. So pairing two swords together means I get their frenzy charge benefits twice. I'll get even more accuracy and crim multiplier. However, this also means I now have minus two to my maximum frenzy charges, bringing my total down to only a single charge. Guess what? We can go even further. There is a unique jewel in the game called pacifism that simply reduces my maximum number of frenzy charges by one. Now my maximum number of charges is zero. Each sword gives minus one, so two in total, and the pacifism brings the final value to negative three. Obviously this means I meet the criteria of having no frenzy charges, but having zero charges also means that my, my maximum number of charges because the max is simply zero, which finally means I am now getting both accuracy and crit multiplier from both of my swords at all times. The wording of the swords tells us exactly what their effects are, but it may not be obvious at first glance how much you can take advantage of this. This is just one example of many about how the wording of items, skills, nodes on the passive tree, and much more are very literal in what they say. I plan to cover a few more examples, if you catch my drift, <laughs> of the specific wording in PoE and how it relates to your gameplay in the second part of my beginner's guide. So again, if you're interested, be on the lookout. For now, just know that taking the time to read each item, skill, and other gameplay aspects you come across will benefit you greatly. Moving on, I want to make the important note that no matter what, the progress you make on your character is never lost. Yes, even if you create a hardcore character which only has a single life. If you die on hardcore, you'll simply be moved to standard league, carrying over everything on your character. The only exception to this is if you're playing in a hardcore challenge league, which I'll explain in just a second, don't worry. You'll have a separate stash, which is where you store the majority of the loot you get, and therefore won't be able to access the items you gathered in the league, aside from what you died with on your character, because the items in your stash stay in the league. Think of it like having a separate bank account. But do not be alarmed, this is only for those of you looking to really challenge yourselves and play a hardcore core character. If you are just starting out, I highly recommend you choose the default challenge league, which will have a blue banner displayed and already be selected for you when you start the game. Dying in a default or standard league will never result in the loss of items, whether they're on your character or in your stash. Now, what do I mean by challenge leagues? Well, the game currently functions on a bit of a cycle. Most people play in the challenge leagues, or just leagues for short. Each league is a fresh start that occurs about every three months, bringing new additions to the core mechanics of PoE through new skills, new items, and most importantly, new mechanics. We call the new mechanics league mechanics because they are drastically different or even brand new addition to PoE. Playing in a league is like playing on a ranked ladder in your given competitive game. Once the season is over for PoE the league, then you will have a little bit of downtime and start again fresh. When I say most people play the league, I mean pretty much all of them. A lot of PoE players have been around for quite a bit, so to avoid completely burning out and never playing the game again, they'll stick around from anywhere for a few weeks to a couple months of a given challenge league, stop playing, and then come back fresh after a nice break for the next league. Again, the new content added with each league is more often than not worth at least making one character and testing it out, especially because at the end of the league, all characters and stashes, so all your items that you acquired over the league, are moved into the permanent, standard, or hardcore leagues, respectively. Nothing on those leagues is ever wiped, so if you fancy a more permanent progression style, then trying out PoE in the permanent standard league is your best bet. Another topic I want to go over is the importance of the economy in this game. Trading is the lifeblood of PoE. Without trading, the items you get would essentially be meaningless as soon as you acquired a better one, something that deals more damage, has greater defense, etc. To complement, crafting items are the fibers that hold trading together. The comparison probably didn't make any sense, so just know that crafting and trading are very, very, very important to this game. Now, this doesn't mean you are forced to do either. In fact, if something like Old School RuneScape's Iron Man mode suits your fancy, there is an equivalent mode in PoE called Solo Self-Bound, where you cannot interact 
contract with any other players for any reason. For most of you, however, being in a trade league, simply not solo cell found is the way to go. The trading currency in PoE is not gold coins, which may be odd at first. They're actually your crafting materials. The gold standard is the chaos orb. Most items are priced around them. You will find a few chaos orbs while you level up your character, and I'd recommend hanging on to them because, again, they are a crafting material, so you can consume them. Save them for once you get a better understanding of the game, specifically trading for better items, because you can often buy a much better item for a single chaos from another player, rather than using it to hopefully roll an item yourself. The higher end items are priced around exalted orbs, which are the equivalent of anywhere from 50 to 150 chaos orbs. I say anywhere from that range because each new league brings with it a fresh economy, which is also a huge draw to the three month leagues. The price of exalted orbs naturally mean they are much, much rarer than chaos. If you get one of these as a drop in your first playthrough, you most certainly have a bit of RNG on your side. Also, I should mention that aside from a few accessories in the end game, pretty much any item and any currency can be found in any zone, meaning there's always something to look forward to while just killing random trash mob. Personally, this is one of the reasons I love grinding this game out. It's exciting knowing that I can get amazing items at any time. I don't have to be doing like the hardest content or anything. There are some restrictions on that rule, specifically while you are leveling a character. For example, exalted orbs can only drop in zones where the monsters are level 35 and above. Now that you know the importance of trading in the economy, let's go over money, as in your money. In the beginning of the video, I mentioned that there is a real money purchase that I highly recommend for those of you that reach the end game. And don't worry, the topic right after this will explain what the end game is. The purchase is a single premium stash tab. By default, you have four regular stash tabs to work with. This will be more than enough space for your leveling process and your first foray into the end game. The difference in a premium stash tab is among being able to change the name and the color of the tab, it can be made public. A public tab is one that is visible to the trading API, which is simply the system that shows all items available to trade. There is a free workaround to this using regular stash tabs, but it requires installing third-party software, which don't get me wrong, is not the end of the world, but the ease of simply having a tab to dump any item into trade is very useful. You can configure a premium tab to be public by simply right-clicking it and checking the public box. Then you can select whether or not you want each item to be priced the same, which is useful in a bulk selling tab, or, and I recommend this one, to price each item individually. I won't cover the actual trading process in detail in this video, so if you're looking for the details on how to trade and how to find good items to buy, etc., that will be in part two. The final topic I want to cover is the end game. What is the grind? How grindy is the grind? Is it fun? Why should I look forward to it? The end game in Path of Exile revolves around mapping. Maps are, as with pretty much everything, tradable and craftable items that drop from slain monsters. They begin to drop towards the end of the campaign, which is 10 acts total, and once you beat the final boss of Act 10, your mapping journey will begin. Again, I won't cover the specific modifiers, how to get maps, how to sustain maps, or any of that stuff in this video, and that's going to be in part two. Simply put, maps have tiers. They begin at tier 1 and go up to tier 16. Most of the player base just abbreviates this by T1 or T16 and so on. T1 to T5 maps are white, T6 to T10 are yellow, and T11 to T16 are red. Just think of it as easy, normal, and hard maps respectively with each color having their own progression inside. As in, a T1 map and a T5 map are both white, but the T5 map will be significantly more challenging relative to the tier 1. You can't just do any white map and expect it to be the same difficulty. T1 maps are monster level 68, and each additional tier adds a level to the zone. So T2 maps have level 69, tier 3 maps have level 70s, and so on. The reason why the monster level is important is because, as I mentioned in the trading section, some items have restrictions on when and where they can drop. Most of these restrictions are tied to monster level and the specific zone, so map they are in. But for the most part, your experience will be killing stuff inside of these maps to get loot and either sell the loot or use it to kill stuff faster. That's it. The progression of these maps come from their drop rates getting progressively lower as the tiers get higher, meaning you'll get way more white maps than yellow maps and especially reds. Also, the tier inside of each color has the same progression for drop rates. You'll be getting way more T6 maps than T10 maps. The point I want to get across with this is that the higher tier maps hold some pretty substantial value, ranging anywhere from one chaos orb to over 20 easily. So not only do the items you get for maps progress your character, but also the maps themselves. Every map you complete and the details for completion are slightly different depending on the color of the map will add it to your atlas. The atlas is just a place to track the maps which you have done. Every map you complete on the atlas adds a bonus to the potential maps you'll receive. This bonus is an additional 1% chance for any drop map to be one tier higher than usual. There are well over 100 maps to complete, so once you hit a bonus of 100%, you start getting the chance of drop maps being two tiers above. I know this is getting really convoluted for some of you, but all you need to know is that the more maps you complete, the higher chance you have at receiving higher tier maps. An important note is that completion, for the sake of the atlas, only occurs once per map of the same 
name. Each different map of the same tier that you complete will add 1%. You can't spam a single map and repeatedly get plus 1%. Now, the most important question of all is, is it fun? I mean, that was a lot of info I just went over for maps and it sounded complicated, so it will probably take a lot of work, right? Yes and no. You can literally just throw in any map and instantly pop in, kill the monsters, pop out and repeat if you want. The draw to maps and why they are fun, to answer the question, is that they are a very detailed system with a ton of progression happening on many different levels. Once you get into it, you'll understand. The more maps you complete means the more you receive, means the higher maps you receive, means the more loot you receive, means the greater chance of better loot you receive, means the more money you make, and so forth. There's so many layers. Plus, if you do want to take a break from maps, there are a few other meta systems that have been implemented in the game from past league mechanics. These are your immortal syndicates, your incursions, your delves, and your bestiaries. I won't cover the details of these here because, quite frankly, the reliance on these systems and their existence in the first place is a completely separate video with tons of context. Just know they are there for those of you who want to get more ways to grind the end game aside from mapping. The mapping is very fun and you should do it, okay? All right, and that pretty much does it with everything I wanted to cover in part one of my beginner's guide to Path of Exile. If you enjoyed this video and are interested in learning specific gameplay mechanics, such as the passive tree, stats on items, trading for upgrades, and much more, be on the lookout for part two. Consider subscribing, you'll be notified when the video is released. Also, I stream live very consistently at twitch.tv slash woollygaming, where I plan to start streaming PoE content as soon as the next league is released. For now, it'll be Risk of Rain 2 stuff. Thank you for watching.